Well, good afternoon, folks, and thanks again for joining yet another installment of the Texas Public Policy Foundation's weekly policy live stream. As you know, we've been covering all of the important topics that have been relevant during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, the attendant government response, obviously given the circumstances of the last week and a half with concerns about protests and injustice, we'll be covering those topics in coming weeks. But today we're in for a real treat because we have one of the most important policymakers in our nation's capital, Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan joining us. Mr. Hargan is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, a position he's held for more than two years. He is a lifelong public servant, a law professor, has been someone who's really been the architect of some of the real important reforms under the Trump administration regarding health care. And it is through my colleague, David Balot, the executive director of our Right on Healthcare project, that we met Mr. Hargan. And so I have the great pleasure, as I do each week, of facilitating the conversation between Mr. Hargan and Mr. Balot. So both to you, Mr. Hargan, and to you, David, with whom I not only get to work each day, but of course, we just work a couple of offices from each other. It's going to be a, a great conversation as we explore the government response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as we also explore some of the projects that are coming up in the future for the Trump administration and the healthcare industry. So Mr. Hargan, we'll start with the first question with you. Sure. And that is that the White House recently released the guidelines for opening up America in conjunction with the Center for Disease Control. Tell us just from kind of a 30,000 foot view, how that effort's going and what you've learned so far. Yeah, well, you know, so far it has been going very well. I mean, we've seen states sort of stepping out on safely reopening for some time at this point and weeks that have been going on at this point. I think we've been really gratified with the, uh, the sort of maintenance of generally of kind of a low level of coronavirus infection uh, that's been happening. Certainly not what was predicted. There were some dire predictions about what would happen as some of these jurisdictions reopened, uh, which has not largely been seen. And I'd say that there's a larger issue that we face at HHS. There's, we, have, we sort of have a lot of different functions in the healthcare space. And we've seen by the same time we've been working on the viral suppression you know, we've got, and obviously the infectious disease and curbing that is important. There are many aspects of healthcare that have arisen as a result of the lockdowns primarily. And so we've, we've been, especially as the lockdowns have lengthened, we've seen a lot of bad results in terms of mental health, behavioral health, substance use, uh, child and spousal abuse issues. That's on that side. But then also to remember that non-communicable diseases. So those are the ways that most Americans die. So you're talking about heart disease, cancer, uh, diabetes, COPD, all of these issues. And those are areas where we've seen a lot of times patients are not coming in to get care. They're not, they're not taking care of themselves at this point from a healthcare point of view, either because there's no way for them to do so, or they're scared of going into the healthcare system. Uh, and that is gonna result, we believe it's already resulting and a lot of people not getting care, not really not getting important things like heart bypass surgery, cancer screenings, and so on. We've seen the results happening right along the board. And then the sort of <clears throat> one of the uh, serious issues from a really old, old public health perspective is childhood immunizations. Uh, you know, you've got cohorts of children now, two, three months cohort of children that by and large have not been immunized against those vaccine preventable illnesses. And that, they join groups that didn't get them last year, uh, just routinely didn't get them. You add those to like a cohort of children that really didn't get them at all. Uh, and we could be facing something very serious if we don't get sort of our handle on that. So opening up America is not just dealing with sort of dollars and health, but it's health versus health. So just speaking from an HHS point of view, we have to be able to get people to get back getting their health care. Uh, one way or another. Uh, so again, it's not that false, it sort of it's turned into a false dichotomy of kind of healthcare against the economy. It's not that simple. Well, th thanks for that response, Mr. Hargan. I'll come back and ask you a follow-up question regarding your day-to-day your -day job as the chief operating officer of that very large department and maybe some of the lessons uh, learned, not at all from a, from a gotcha kind of point of view. We don't ask that of of any of our guests, whether they be conservative or liberal, but just from the standpoint of policymaking. But before I ask that follow-up question, just want to invite David into the conversation. And, and obviously, David, 
you with a lot of experience as a hospital administrator, sort of on the sidewalk level, probably can, can understand much of what the deputy secretary mentioned. But I'm also curious, mm -hmm. as I know many of our audience members are, based on your experience, based on what you've been doing as a policy leader in this arena, what do you think we've learned as a people, number one, about the coronavirus itself, sort of the, the, the health question, and then secondly, about the government response to such a pandemic? Well, and I agree with the Deputy Secretary that, that we have learned a lot about health versus health. And, and uh, let, me, let me speak to the response. Mm -hmm. uh, when many of the government agency, agencies shut down uh, healthcare providers, and prohibited any kind of elective procedure, I think people really didn't understand what an elective procedure was. It's not that those, those types of uh, interventions are, are uh, not emergent, it's just that they're schedulable. That's, that's the definition of what elective is. And uh, there was just a, a rush to get things uh, done in response to perhaps a, a, a media push to make things happen that, uh, wasn't done as, as, as methodically and with as much forethought as, as should have been done. Um, and hopefully, I think these are, these are lessons that we can take with us into the future. Thanks, David. Uh, yep. Deputy Secretary Hargan, curious in the, in the vein of this follow-up question, obviously the Department of Health and Human Services is one of the largest bureaucracies in government, probably making it one of the largest bureaucracies in the world. And we're grateful for the service of people who work there, starting with the Secretary and with you. I'm curious, being a historian, what you and, and your, your other colleagues in leadership have learned from this particular pandemic that you will apply to the next round. And I think we're, we're blessed in large part because of, of the response to this crisis that most of us, at least here in Austin, Texas, don't have a whole lot of health concerns right now. That doesn't mean we're being dismissive of a potential surge in the winter months, but I think we're at a position now in the early summer of 2020 that we can start diagnosing, if you will, this pandemic from a policy point of view. And I'm curious in that vein, what lessons you've learned. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of detailed lessons that I'm not gonna get into too much detail about, about supply chain, although there is there are lessons learned about domestic supply chain for medical supplies. I think that's something we're gonna have to look at very closely, like that we sort of, in many cases, put our eggs in one basket uh, with regard to a single country, China, that uh, we got a lot of our medical supplies from. But just generally kind of knowing and having a more sort of more transparency into what, what we're actually able to access and when we're able to access it. Uh, and that goes across an, the entire array, of whether it's diagnostics and testing, uh, what we do about the regulatory processes with regard to vaccines and therapeutics and approvals more generally. And I think one of the lessons that I think that we're going to have to really think through is we responded uh, to this crisis in many ways, and I think which is unusual for a central government by adopting a deregulatory stance. Um, instead of centralizing decision making and centralizing and, and sort of creating more regulatory structure and more centralization of power, we did the opposite. We, we tried to decentralize decision-making to the state and local political leadership to make decisions for their own communities. And we deregulated to kind of empower private industry to respond with the ingenuity and the productive capacity that they're capable of to be able to provide the things that were needed by the healthcare sector to respond to the pandemic. And I think that those have been very successful uh, by and large. I think when we look at the, I mean, just point of pride, I'm the chief regulatory officer of the department. Uh, that's sort of my whole past. I was deputy general counsel for regulations and regulatory policy officer of HHS under President Bush. And as a law professor that did administrative law and healthcare regulations in Chicago, a regulatory lawyer, now I'm the chief regulatory officer. So this is kind of my peculiar passion in this area. And point of pride, HHS, the last two years was the number one deregulatory department in the federal government. Uh, and so we were already kind of in train to do that because this was one of the focuses that president put on the administration, which I very much welcomed. And that was what we were doing already day to day. But when this hit, we adopted a lot of sort of immediate deregulatory steps on a variety of fronts, whether it's the sort of telehealth and telemedicine front, which was, which we did an immense loosening on, uh, but at several of our agencies whether it was on issues of scope, and I can return to that, 
uh, or I can talk about right now. I mean, telehealth and telemedicine, you know, both, it was always allowed for kind of rural areas. Uh, and, but to have it more generally available, both from kind of a reimbursement regulatory point of view, that's the Medicare and Medicaid side. And then in HIPAA, uh, we allowed people to use not these specialty telemedicine programs, but FaceTime and Skype, things that are sort of more broadly available, uh, which meant that people could get them. Uh, we also allowed audio telehealth for those more senior, the older seniors and very rural and remote areas don't often have broadband. So we allowed them to use some varieties of audio telehealth. So in that area, we went from first week of March, we had about 11,000 beneficiaries doing telehealth. By the first week of April, we had 650,000 beneficiaries. So we had a 60 fold increase in the number of beneficiaries uh, using telemedicine, which at least I don't think that's really a coronavirus issue. I think that's something that was probably an issue that was already there on the ground. It was already something that people really wanted or needed in this space that now they're taking advantage of. So we're really scrubbing down on those flexibilities that we put in place and working with Congress on that because the Rural Caucus and others are very much interested in trying to make these permanent at this point. So we're kind of going through and kind of saying, is this something we can do as administration? Is this something that Congress will have to kind of weigh in on when the emergency comes down, when the president and the secretary say emergency is over, some of these go away by their nature. So we have to kind of figure out which ones would need legislation and which ones don't. So that's the uh, that's going to be the thing we're going to be undertaking scope of practice issues. So can you practice the top of your license? Uh, people working with states to see whether people can practice across state lines. Our quality uh, initiative, which is kind of can be a very dry issue, but it's something that's thrown into relief uh, by the by simply canceling the quality uh, system for the pendency of the crisis and nothing happening. Uh, so that was kind of the dog that didn't bark uh, in a lot of our regulatory areas. Uh, so we've got a lot of those on foot right now. And I think that was one of the big ones. It just, they just kind of, uh, uh, industry really responded when we deregulated in a really uh, serious way. And I think it has been taken up by people, by the sector, by patients, by providers. And I think it provides a real object lesson about how to respond uh, in the middle of these things uh, to sort of say, sometimes the attitude is really loosening, not tightening when you get into a crisis that allows everyone this sort of response across the country to a pandemic. And what's fascinating to me about that coming from my, my vantage point of, of understanding federalism and the work of our foundation, which is to restore a proper understanding of federalism, is that you and your leadership colleagues did the exact opposite of what many sort of sideline observers were saying, which is to hyper-centralize. So in the United States, there are a whole bunch of reasons that wouldn't work. Y'all trusted your, not just your gut instincts, but obviously you've got expertise in, in how this response should go. And as you said, loosened rather than tightened that control. It's, I think as we diagnose, first of all, the, the health pandemic, but also the government response to it over the last few months, at least at the federal level, that that's going to really withstand the test of time. So, David, I know you've worked a lot on some of that regulation. Just curious if, if you would, for the sake of our audience members, highlight some of those deregulation efforts. Well, and I really want to applaud the messaging that came out prior to the deregulation. The president, many of the governors, local uh, elected officials came out and said, look, we're going to loosen, suspend, and, and reduce some of these regulations so that we can make the relationship between doctor and patient closer and be more efficient in that process, which really causes you to think where they needed in the first place. And so I certainly do hope that Congress learns from, uh, from these lessons and the actions of HHS and, and makes many of these things permanent. But we've seen so many uh, good things uh, that, that have been loosened. The Deputy Secretary has alluded to many of them. Um, telemedicine has just been a, a, a great um, uh, aspect of, of, of what has been going on. And we really hope that that will continue to help our rural communities that uh, are, are suffering the most. Yeah, and I, we actually have uh, been talking with a number of congressmen about it uh, that are interested on the on the Hill in doing these. In fact, I think uh, just was recently talking to Chip Roy there from Texas, uh, and he's actually put out a bill that is an interesting bill. It kind of is a reverse uh, bill that says all of our flexibility stay in place unless Congress says so. So it essentially freezes our flexibilities in place unless Congress says otherwise. 
So we're not, he, he doesn't want us to be able to go back unless they let us. So we have to stay on the maximum flexibility and reform aspect unless otherwise authorized. So it's a reverse of what, uh, a very interesting idea. That, it it is. It's no, no surprise to you and your staff, I'm sure that's music to our ears as we prepare for the Texas legislative session, which will begin here in January 2021. I'm sure we'll be supporting similar bills at the state level. And, and as you probably know, Congressman Roy is a former colleague of ours and, and was sitting in your seat figuratively last week as, as the guest on this policy okay. primer. So uh, both of you and, and very good company. So I'm curious, Deputy Secretary Hargan, about one particular component of something you just mentioned, and that's about rural hospitals. And I, I know a lot of our audience members are tuning in from more rural parts of Texas, probably even more rural parts of, of the United States, outside Texas, that is. And I'm curious if you can look into your crystal ball and, and assess for them what they're reading in the news almost every week, which is that rural hospitals, or many of them, may not survive this pandemic. Well, you know, we, we have, by way of background also, you may or may not know, like I grew up on a farm in deep Southern Illinois, uh, and my mother worked at a rural hospital uh, outside of our town of 800 uh, for 58 years. Uh, so I was raised kind of underfoot in a rural hospital and with a family that you know, maybe half or more of them still work in kind of in rural healthcare and whatever function, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, so on. Uh, so we're the, that kind of world is pretty much my background in this. So I, we really do, at least at, uh, you know, at my level in the department, we really do kind of understand uh, in a, a lived experience, right, as you might say nowadays, of, of rural health care. So it's, it is an important element uh, to, to us here at HHS, to the president as well. Frankly, he asks about these issues with regard to rural health care specifically. Uh, because we do know that the system is under threat. Part of the way it's been addressed through Congress is this provider relief fund, so we're, which we're administering uh, out, of, uh, out of HHS, $175 billion. Uh, we recently, maybe two, three weeks ago, we released $10 billion to rural hospitals, rural health clinics. Uh, that's part of the, part of the uh, tranches of money that we're sending out. There was a general distribution that got them some, and then we had a specific tranche for rural hospitals. Now, with regard to rural health in general, um, there are there are other issues. We're and I think we're going to we've been working with the rural hospital groups uh, and the rural health groups to think through where everything is going uh, in that space. Uh, is it going to be a model that kind of I grew up with early on, which is the sort of general hospital in the small town that is you know that, or is it going to be something that is a little bit more adapted to Kind of realities on the ground how americans get their care when you think about tele like i said about telehealth and telemedicine that's not a rural hospital model but when you talk about sort of distributed care remote patient monitoring trying to kind of a lot of the ways that people want their health care delivered we have to make sure it's in rural america that's one out of every six americans roughly uh, lives in a rural area at this point that's a lot of americans <laughs> frankly um, and uh, they have to get health care too uh, and so how do we do that? Provide the access that they need, that expertise um, that without, uh, you know, without kind of saying you have to move to a big city to get it, go to a big city to get it. Frankly, with information technology as it is, uh, there should be a way to get this information there to enable local providers to provide that expertise, get that expertise. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of proposals on foot right now. So we're, we're going to be looking forward to engaging on that from an administration point of view, but then I think more broadly in the government overall, uh, uh, Secretary Azar put kind sort of a rural health task force together about a year and a half ago. And we've been working through a lot of proposals uh, to kind of get, get, to, uh, get to a good package that we're gonna be rolling out here. Uh, but we got coronavirus happened. So uh, these and other things, uh, Kind of got pushed up naturally uh, because of that pendency of that, but we're looking forward to reengaging on that uh, as soon as we possibly can. David, yeah, you, you mentioned some of the other proposals. I wanted to ask, of course, the rural hospitals uh, have, have suffered, but another group that's really taken um, uh, a beating 
uh, during these times are the independent physicians and uh, those that uh, you know care for our communities. Do any of those proposals address the needs of those practices and those individuals so that uh, yeah. they have some, some idea of what to look for in the future? So I'll start with the, the, the fund itself. So actually I'll go back to that provider relief fund. So they, the immediate, let's talk about the immediate needs. Um, they are, they were able to go in and some of them did, many of them did go into the portal we opened up to kind of get access to the money. And we look forward to that happening again in the future. That's for the immediate needs that independent practitioners have during the, the coronavirus. So putting that off to one side, the sort of larger issues we think will be addressed by some of the other initiatives we have on the deregulatory front. A lot of pressure that's come on to uh, small providers, independent providers from the, the ongoing consolidation in the healthcare sector really pr puts a lot of pressure on them. There's a few things that do it. Some of it is the paperwork and the regulatory uh, overlay, which when a small practitioner, you just can't bear that and remain in business in many ways. A larger entity is able to work with coders and billers and attorneys and accountants hire those people to do what needs to be done in the paperwork. A small practitioner can't always do that. You know, we were looking at a, at a situation where um, one of just one of our regulations, we met with an independent physician and he said, you know, I get about 40% of my uh, gross revenue comes from Medicare. And this one particular program was about 10% of that, but it's about 4%. This gross revenue is practice was from this one regulation, regulatory piece. He said, but I have to hire two people to keep track of just the information you all make us send in. So he's like, he's, he's getting eaten alive by the amount of paperwork. So part of that is what we've done. CMS has done patients over paperwork. Some of it is the general regulatory overlay that we're trying to remove. That'll remove the pressure on them. Some of it is where, we're working on this, uh, what's called Stark and anti-kickback reform, this regulatory sprint to coordinated care. That is trying to remove some of the obstacles in some of the major regulatory regimes that we have that should allow independent physicians and independent physician groups to affiliate with other providers like hospitals and so on without having to be bought by them, without having to consolidate with them legally to be able to do all kinds of, uh, to either share information with our HIPAA reforms or affiliate with them through the Stark and anti kickback reforms without having to become employees. So that's another sort of major area is to allow them not to have to become employees, which is often a concern for independent physicians. They don't want to be. The general regulatory overlays, which we're trying to relieve on them, on the, which will hopefully relieve a lot of those burdens that we think are crushing them and leading to burnout. And then, as I say, in the immediate relief, that'll be there'll be more of that available to them with Corona, the actual Corona expenses and lost revenue. Thanks for that response. I have a couple of other questions before we pivot to our audience questions, Mr. Hargan. And so, for for our audience members, if you have a question, you can just enter those into the comments box. And here in a few minutes, we'll get through as many of those as as possible. But the first of the two questions I have, both for you and for David is a little more of a, I guess, a common sense question or a question for those of us who, unlike the two of you, are just sort of come at this as observers. Obviously, we, we hope to participate successfully in the healthcare industry whenever that comes up, but we're looking at this from kind of a 30,000 foot view. And, and so it's not specific to policy from the department, Mr. Hargan, or David, even from your policy world, but for, for users, potential users of the healthcare industry, what is, is going to change permanently, if anything, as a result of this crisis for your average consumer of healthcare? Mr. Hargan, why don't you start? Okay. Well, there's a, I would say a few things. I don't want to sort of be too repetitive here, but I think the rising role of telehealth, telemedicine, and information technology that has been built out because now the providers are much more used to using them or more comfortable with using them. So a lot of times there's gonna be, I think people are gonna find it easier to interact with their doctors without having to go to the doctor's office. I think that's gonna be a big element here. I think if the 
the issues about scope of practice, in other words, loosening the ability of, of the allied health professionals, as we call them, the, the physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, advanced practice nurses, and so on, to have sort of a, a greater scope for their work. I think that means that there'll be more access for patients, but it will probably be, there'll probably be other than doctor interactions, right? Until we can kind of fill out more doctors uh, in the medical schools. Uh, so there'll be more, probably more access more broadly uh, to healthcare, I'd say, but at a more technological level. And the third thing I would say, which isn't coronavirus, but it took place in the middle, was, was a big deal that I had helped very strongly spent a lot of time on, which is the interoperability rules, which feed into the same thing. And this is allowing all Americans to have access to their personal health records from whichever place they are on an app for free. That was called out in the Cures Act almost four years ago. We finally put the regulations in place in early March, which was like just as we were entering into more serious phase of the corona we were done with those launched them and now those are sort of the the days are ticking by now towards when those have to be sort of made real and people have to start providing uh health records uh not information blocking so that it, and and being able to provide access to those through an app so um, i'm going to bet the it industry uh is probably busily working on those things now uh and i think that's going to be a huge uh, issue moving forward is everybody being able to have their records eventually in their own hands from whatever source, completely portable health records, uh, basic health records for free on their smartphone. I think those are some large, large issues uh, when people have all of that information in front of them. It's going to change their relationship, I think, to their health, to their providers. I think those are three bigs, probably interoperability, tele telemedicine, and then kind of the rise of the allied health professions. The third one being a little less clear right now, but the first two, I think, being pretty clear. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, as, as from a think tank perspective, we study the short-term and long-term consequences of the pandemic and the shutdown. We're seeing what, what our audience members are seeing from their common sense perspective, that whether it's in how workplaces operate or in some sectors of education, whether K-12 or higher ed, and now we're learning from you and from David also in healthcare, that technology has sort of achieved this, this central place in reforming how we go about the actual service, or whether that be education or whatever work industry we're in or in, in healthcare. And I think that's really crucial. So David, why don't you speak to some of those long-term, perhaps even permanent changes from the standpoint of the consumer? I'd like to speak to probably the most important one from my perspective, which is uh, the executive order that the president put out uh, on transparency. Yeah. And I, I know that the, the hospital association and, and their insurer groups that have been fighting that executive order and it's in litigation now, uh, you know, their, their assertion is that uh, people don't want to see what real pricing uh, is. They, that they are concerned only with their benefits and real pricing would only confuse people. But we know that to not be the case. And uh, that's, that's, you know, the deputy secretary spoke of uh, having information accessible on your phone, having pricing would be transformational to the healthcare industry. Being able to shop because deductibles being what they are today, as high as they are, uh, people are, are essentially cash shoppers. Mm -hmm. So finding the best deal for a CAT scan, an MRI, a doctor's visit, would certainly be used by, by the American people today. So I applaud the efforts in, in, in uh, the administration and the agency to continue to push for transparency and real pricing. Yeah, we took it on. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see what the we'll see what the courts uh, say about that. I mean, I think that yeah, you're right. The element of a market to make a real market in healthcare that, it, you know, it's an area of goods and services, and it, to not be able to have a real price in the hands of the consumers has meant that you haven't been able to develop a true market in this space where you have real competition. Uh, we have a lot of people in the space. You have a lot of different actors in the place. So we've got. We've got competition, but we don't have a price. So there's not there's no, there's no real price there. So it's really hard to do that. We're also going to try to help deal with the quality issue as well. But the the price, what you're paying, quality, what you're getting, competition. I think those three elements. If we could just lay the tracks down for that to eventually 
kind of transform healthcare the way it had, the way the market will transform uh, any place where it's allowed in strongly. Well, gentlemen, we'll pivot here to audience questions here in a moment, but one final question for me, at least for now, I may have multiple final questions as it turns out. But again, this is from the, the vantage point of just trying to understand what success looks like for years, for 25 years now in American policy, even longer. We've been measuring so-called success in American healthcare policy by the number of people who are insured. I think the three of us and many of our audience members know that while that's relevant, that may not necessarily be the chief metric of success. And so my question is sort of the, the visionary question, you know, five years, 10 years, maybe fewer years down the road, both for you, Mr. Hargan, and for you, David, what, is, what does success look like? I mean, you both use the word transformation. And I'm curious that if, let's say you had a magic wand and political obstacles, industry obstacles were not in the way, what does that transformation in healthcare look like for the average American consumer? Well, I mean, you know, I could just revert back to the HHS slogan, you know, we're living, you know, longer, healthier lives, right? I mean, that that's what the ultimate goal of healthcare is, right? You live longer, healthier lives. Uh, now, how do you get there? Uh, yeah, obviously, we've done a good job in the United States on innovation, generally, right? We've done, a, we've done a great job. Almost all the innovation, when you talk about good services, system transformation, we do it. Uh, it's a decentralized system. It rewards innovation. We get a lot of that. The pressure has come, and that's why the question of insurance and those areas come up, because the price, because the cost of the system uh, has meant that that's created its own challenge. And the push has come, whether it's in the form of, you know, legislative changes, pressures from employers, pressures on all kinds of things on the cost. Uh, the thing that we have to do is to make the cost match the benefits that we know we're getting out of this system right now. We know we're getting a lot of benefits out of the system, constantly new drugs, new devices, like better techniques, better surgeries, better innovative use of these things to make people's lives better, make, you know, getting surgeries or cancer. We're solving in entire sets of diseases and disease states that we couldn't do before. Medicine's actually working. It's not just sort of you know, it's not a fable. This is actually working, but we throw a lot of money at it. That's creating its own pressure. So I think for me, this sounds like kind of small ball. I'm not giving you like some big vision, but the fact is, is like to preserve the system and the innovation that we have in its, that we have, but be able to remove the pressures on it by getting a rational system of cost in place. And I think market-based cost is what essentially is going to be needed. The more that comes in, the more it's going to be aligned with what people's needs are. That's what's going to align their needs and wants with the things that we can achieve in the system. And I think that's the most sustainable way we can do that. And I don't mean in a green way, it's not sustainability in a green way, but in a practical way. The only way is to get those that market system aligned with what we're getting right. from our system. Thank you. David? Yeah, you know, it was discussed earlier. Uh, what happens when you want to get something done? You deregulate. Uh, we saw yeah. with uh, what the president did in the economy. We've seen what HHS has done it uh, during the pandemic. And what happened is, is we, we got results. The deputy secretary is exactly right. People care more about the affordability of healthcare than anything else. And in fact, affordability is a function of access. When we hear our, our elected officials talk about health care, they're not talking about health care. They're talking about health insurance. And it's important that we not conflate the two. Yeah. Do we want people to have access? Absolutely. But giving them more insurance is not going to give them good health care. And we, we, we're, we're, we're mixing those two, two um, uh, issues up, and, and we've got to be sure that we're targeting uh, care solutions for those that may need it. Yeah, we're even mixing up one type of financing mechanism with the whole issue of cost. Yeah. Like, I mean, in other words, it's a financing mechanism to achieve that cost issue and accessibility. Like that's, it's a, it's just one way of doing this, right? It's not the only way of doing it. So, you know, but if people have been obsessed with that issue, that's, that's for sure. So if I were, thank you gentlemen for the, the responses to that question. I know it's on the minds of audience members, if I were writing the headline based on your excellent responses, it would be, this is America, let's continue to have the 
uniquely excellent healthcare we have relative to other countries while making it more transparent and therefore a lot less expensive, both for the government and of course for the consumer. So thank you. So here I am continuing to ask these follow-up questions. And as is often the case, if not always the case, our audience members have even better questions. And so Mr. Hargan and, and David will go directly into them. So I'll just read the first one verbatim and, and we'll pitch it to you first, Deputy Secretary. And that is, with patients being afraid to seek health care, a hold on elective care, employees losing their insurance or unable to afford the premiums, why can't the insurance companies do more to help? Well, you know, you look at, let's sort of unpack those. Patient confidence is its own thing. I mean, that that is something where uh, we I've been talking to hospital CEOs for the past few weeks and they are seeing their patients no matter what it is, like they would say, you have to come in for your heart bypass surgery. You've got to come in for your cancer care. 35, 50% of patients just immediately canceling that. They're not interested at all in going in. In fact, the most fragile patients are the ones most worried about going into a hospital where there could be an infection. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing this, this very strange situation where the patients most in need of care aren't going in. I'm not sure what an insurance company can do about that. Patient comp, we've done some prime, Preliminary surveys, patients will listen to their doctors, number one, to come back in, two, to their hospitals. I think the government is like a strong number four. Uh, media is the bottom uh, in the surveys that we've seen so far. So it's really hard for people to kind of listen and come back in for care. So that's to address that one issue. I think insurance companies, you know, I don't know that we've, we've, they have been doing some things. They have been loosening some of their some of the things that they're doing in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. They have been kind of following along in this from what I can see so far. Although I'm going to say I haven't like I haven't tracked all the things that they're going to do. What can they do? They've been doing some things that I can say, but I'm not here primarily to represent them. So uh, I'm not sure where we would where we would land if we had to do it's kind of a scrub bottom up scrub of what they. <laughs> I'd refer that back to you all. Oh, sure. Fair enough. David, it sounds like the deputy secretary is deferring to you. I'm happy to take it on. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, regardless of who you ask for help, be careful of the kind of help that you're going to get. Uh, I, that's why I think it's, in, it's incumbent upon us to put uh, more control in the hands of the patients. Put them in the driver's seat. Allow them to use and, and spend the, their, their own money the way that uh, uh, they know is best for, for healthcare. Healthcare, you know, Deputy Secretary alluded to this as well. Um, healthcare is extremely local. It's, it's community-based. Even in our hospitals, our primary service area was one to three miles, depending on facility. That's very, very local. So it's, it's not a great idea to manage uh, an entire industry and a, and a type of, of care solution from Washington, D.C., or even from, from various state capitals. We need to empower individuals to make the best decisions. So I'm not necessarily in favor of, of uh, having hat in hand and going to the insurance companies, even though they've done extremely well during the pandemic. Um, I think we need to give power back to the individuals. Good. Well, nice, nice exchange there, gentlemen. So we'll move on to the next audience question. Uh, we have a couple questions about transparency. We'll come back to that as we, we get into a category of questions about looking ahead. But first, want to pick up on another policy question. That's about licensing and medical reciprocity. So here's the question. How does licensing and or medical reciprocity affect the current and future problems our healthcare system faces? Without residency training, this audience member says, medical school graduates cannot practice medicine despite having much more training than nurse practitioners and physician assistants. David, we'll start with you and then we'll move to Mr. Hargan. Certainly. I think, you know, um, there was an allusion to this earlier as well. We're missing out on the supply of physicians. We, mm -hmm. we, we have a shortage because uh, there's a cap on the number of residencies. We have uh, very, uh, very smart individuals that are coming out of medical school and there's a shortage of, of programs for them to get into. So we have uh, medical school trained individuals that can't practice as physicians because there are no residencies there for them. So that's something Congress needs to work on and, and, uh, and, and implement some change for, because you can't complain about the shortage being there, but still creating that bottleneck themselves. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. I think that you know, there need to be more physicians. 
there need to be more everybody. I mean, we, we want, I mean, honestly, there's a huge demand for healthcare in this country. It's going to continue to be, you know, it's a it, country is aging, not as, not as quickly as many of our peers, but it's still, but seniors take three times the amount of uh, money uh, per year as everybody else does in care. So there's a lot of money in there. There's going to be growing amounts of money. We still have 10, 12 years before we even reach the crest of the baby boomers retiring. So you, you really are looking at a long-term issue with the need for more and more medical care. So it could be solved by there being more doctors, partially. It has to be resolved by there being more others uh, in that space as well. We've been concentrating on kind of the, the early entry-level workforce, uh, which is an area also of concern. And things like behavioral health and mental health, there needs to be a lot more practitioners, a lot more education in this space. So. Yes. And I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, we also have allowed medical students to kind of get out there and do work. We got a lot of different openings that were done here. I'm going to anticipate some of those genies are going to go back in the bottle, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what lessons have been learned out there uh, in the field from these flexibilities uh, across the board. Not sure. But as I say, some of the genies are out. Some of the genies might go back in, but we don't know yet. Right. I think that's gonna, there's going to be a lot of discussions going on in the next and, few months. And, and, and just to underscore how the, the system works, which, of course, you know better than anyone, Mr. Hargan, those of us on the outside, whether we have the privilege of working at a policy organization like the Texas Public Policy Foundation or individual members of our audience, they can play a role in keeping those genies out of the bottle, right? So it's, it's really important that there be some external pressure there. We'll, yeah. we'll come back to that in a few moments as we, we move toward closing, but we have a few other questions that I would like to get to. One of them, actually two questions that, that I'll sort of, of meld into one is about transparency. And this is kind of a, a policy, maybe even political, certainly congressional crystal ball kind of question. Mr. Hargan, and that is, what's it going to take to get those transparency rules codified into permanent legislation? Well, you know, I think it's a, some of the transparency rules are where they are. I mean, some of it, we'll wait and see. I mean, the, the things that we've stood out on, on pricing and, and other issues are things that, well, we're going to see where they go. And I think some of it's going to wait to see what the courts say. If we if we have the ability to do this, we're going to do it. Uh, if that's turned back, that's where we're going to have to look to the contours of what uh, we need to do legislatively to have those same principles be put in place through legislation. It's always better to have clear legislative direction in this area. Um, you know, that, that's always better to have it where, you know, we're not we're not kind of putting out a regulation, but we're responding to a direct statutory, you know, imperative that's that's that where they kind of codify in law what we're doing in regulation. That's that's the best thing, uh, but Congress always gives us leeway anyway uh, in the regulatory regime to move these things forward. I think I would say we will wait to see what the courts say. If, if those regulations are left in place in large part, that may be sufficient to create a lot of the transparency that we need. But whatever whatever's left over or whatever we ultimately uh, move forward on, I think that's when we move to the legislative phase and see what's out there. Although I could see people wanting to move forward, but I am prohibited from lobbying or uh, by law as a member of the executive branch, I can't do that. So I gotta be, I'll be very careful here <laughs> We uh, about about the kind of encouraging anything to do with legislation because uh, don't right. want to get my, uh, my uh, hand slapped by Congress on, on those issues. I'd have to leave a lot of it up to those of every not in the executive branch. Well, you, about those things. you get an A plus for your response being both <laughs> substantive as well as steering clear of any trouble, which of course we, we wouldn't want anyone in government service to, to get into. So uh, David, not that what you will say will we'll get the deputy secretary in trouble, but you'd spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, uh, maybe not so much in person the last few months, but once you forecast for our audience members what they might expect whenever uh, that house in particular is back in yeah. session. There's been a lot of talk about transparency being a part of the stimulus packages. And there's, there's a fourth package coming down the pipe. And I think the, the codification of the, the transparency EO is not only needful, but it's appropriate. And, and people would say, well, David, how is that uh, 
related to COVID. I think very, very simply in that uh, many people have lost their, uh, their jobs. They're uninsured. Uh, they, uh, they feel that they don't have access, but nor do they have the information. Uh, with the opacity in, in, in healthcare pricing, having transparency would give people the ability to, to see what's there and see what's affordable uh, and go to those that might be more affordable than others. Yeah, thank you for that response. So gentlemen, one, one more question from the audience and then I'll ask you the final, final question, which is kind of a, a big picture question that we ask all of our guests. The final question from the audience is one that takes a step back from some of the specific policies. In a lot of ways, it has more to do with state by state action, uh, Mr. Hargan, although uh, obviously the Center for Disease Control with, with its guidelines is playing a role here. That question from the audience is, when might we start to see some of the COVID restrictions like wearing masks, limited capacity at restaurants and so on be lifted? Yeah, well, I think that, some of that's going to depend on the progress of the disease and the perception on the part of CDC and the states and the localities on, on what the condition is on the ground. Uh, you know, what we're, what we've been looking at since the beginning, one is flattening the curve. In other words, part of the lockdown and all those restrictions were put in place to make sure the hospital system and the healthcare system didn't turn into some, uh, you know, charnel house. Uh, the way we had seen signs of in other countries before it came here. And so that was the ultimate goal in many ways of a lot of this, a lot of what we've been doing. I think now you're going to have to see, we, we have to have not, and we haven't had a very a national view of this, but we've been doing guidelines for the states and localities. I think it's going to have to even be more minute than that. We're going to have to look at more vulnerable populations, things like nursing homes, uh, more concentration on places where we really know people are going to be vulnerable to, to this disease. And that may mean there will be lingering restrictions on really vulnerable sort of smaller spaces like a nursing home here or a nursing home there, as opposed to saying, I think it's going to gradually constrict itself. Uh, it has been doing that overall. States open up, they leave some regions even more opened up. Those areas, you know, they may so I think as we get a more ability to kind of micro target where there are problems, they'll be able to say, all of you adopt this type of testing, this type of restriction, this type of what, you know, masks, isolation gowns, what have you in this nursing home. I don't know if I'm being as substantive as I should be there, but that's, that's what I see as the general thing. I think that some of these guidelines are just going to stay out there in general but people are gonna to have to get used to them kind of evaporating slowly right. uh, in some parts of the country, more slowly, more quickly, right. uh, and just keeping real surveillance on where there's an outbreak, particularly in vulnerable areas, like vulnerable communities, and even down to the level of this nursing home or that sort of, that town, those kind of things. Thank that's you. How I think I, that's how I guess this goes on. Sure. I, pre I appreciate the perspective. David? It's going to come down to, to trusting our communities. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we look at uh, definitely the vulnerables and we, we target uh, those that are at the highest risk uh, with our elderly and those that are immunosuppressed. Uh, but with those that are, that are healthy and that are community that want to go out and, and be a part of uh, uh, society again, yeah. uh, we need to trust individuals to make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. Yeah. Good. Yeah, let's leave it at that. Yeah, yeah I, I think, and, and you may not be able to take a position on this, Deputy Secretary Hargan, that we're expecting here in Texas, which is pretty much reopened. I mean, there are, yeah. we, here at TBBF, we, we think that other than the exceptions you mentioned, nursing homes, uh, people who are 70 or 75 years of age or older, that we should be 100% reopened. But we're expecting that relative to the rest of the country, Texas is doing so well in every respect that we're probably going to see a spike in our population. So that's fine. I would just encourage everybody as they're crossing the state lines, take off their masks. It's summertime in Texas. It's going to be 102 degrees here in Austin. Uh, yeah. Not a whole lot to worry about unless you're in one of those segments of the population you mentioned. Then, of course, all of us will take whatever steps we need to to, to protect you. Yeah. So, yeah. And look, I mean, it's as I think that's I think that makes sense. I mean, we we that's what we're going to be seeing anyway one way or the other. And that's part of the, 
I think the wisdom of returning, making sure that these decisions are decentralized, making sure that the decision making is, is at the lowest level possible in these areas so that you don't have this sort of a national blanket of, of everyone everywhere do this thing. When you find out that it gets even more like in Texas where you're seeing that happen. Now, are there gonna be spikes in cases? Viruses don't respect borders, of course, um, no one doesn't think that's going to happen. But the ultimate thing we set as a goalpost was flattening the curve yeah. and allowing American industry to respond with productivity of all the things needed, PPE, testing, drugs, all that sort of thing. That's what we're seeing, making sure that the hospitals are stocked, making sure that they're, they're not, they're, they are themselves sort of robust locally. And then the virus will spread. That's the nature of these things. Uh, slowly or more rapidly, but we got to be prepared for that. That's the way these things happen. Uh, but we've always known that. Nobody thought that this virus wouldn't spread because that's the nature of viruses. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, last last question for both of you. If you've been dealing with some 30,000 foot view questions, this is like the 100,000 foot view. It's a question that oh. I try to ask each of our guests each week because I know our audience members really appreciate everyone's different perspective. I think both you, Mr. Hargan, and you, David, uh, share a lot of, of uh, similar perspectives on the issue of healthcare, but you have different points of view, different purviews, really, one from DC and one from Austin. So I think this will be helpful. What encouraging words do you have for our audience members? I think everyone tuning in, regardless of how they would define themselves ideologically, loves this country, those tuning in from Texas love this state. They appreciate the conversation we've had, but you know, I think they're rightly worried about what they've seen in 2020 with the pandemic, with the government response, now what's going on in so many cities and the angst that millions of Americans feel. I'm not asking you to get into the detail, Mr. Hargan or David, but just leaving us with something optimistic because ultimately the, the gist of this foundation, why we come to work each day with smiles in our faces is because we're optimistic. And I think more and more Americans are feeling like uh, the American Republic is, is under some serious strain. So what would you say in response to that that would encourage individuals who've tuned in to go out there and, and do something that makes a difference? Well, I would say you've seen from sort of, and again, I'm, again, these are silver linings to find in here, right? These are silver linings is what we've been talking about just now. We were able to keep put in place at the beginning some of the some of the changes that we needed to have in this in this middle of this pandemic we didn't respond by seizing up seizing central control and and over regulating the space sort of that centralizing thing didn't happen by and large we ended up with spreading that spreading this out we had kind of in a so in a i think an unexpected way a liberty moment uh in some ways for this strange but true in the middle of all this this and we're retracking now towards what we were planning on doing at the end in other words the country came through this it is not it was never good to go through a pandemic it's never good for any of this to happen to any of the countries that have been involved in it but i think we came through it with with the healthcare sector at least for me to speak of came through it I think magnificently in many ways. What, I mean, it was an early hit in the middle of flu season with a new virus that came out of essentially nowhere from our point of view. We were able to deal with it in the depths of the worst possible time for it to hit us, January, February, March of a relatively cold season, and we dealt with it. Everybody responded. Dozens of new diagnostics, drugs, all kinds of things came forward. We dealt with this as a country. We were prepared for it better than most other countries around the world. And we got hit with it pretty hard. Uh, and so this, I think, is a good lesson. But when you unleash the ingenuity, the productive capacity of this country, it can do anything. And we've managed, to, we're retracking ourselves back to where we were before. I hope, I pray, we didn't take any sort of fundamental hit in terms of our sort of ideals and what we're trying to do. But I don't, I don't think so. I think it actually is quite the opposite. I've learned the opposite lesson anyway, and I hope everyone else does too. Thank you. David? I want to look at it from a little bit different perspective. I hope everybody can be encouraged by 
recognizing that as, as, as expensive as healthcare is, I want to be able to say to you that healthcare today is affordable. It's just a matter of where, whether, uh, if you know where to look. And I think that, that that's incredibly important and I want to uh, make myself available. Uh, you can go and, and find us and find a, a way to contact me at texaspolicy.com. And we also with Right On Healthcare have a newsletter that, that we push out uh, stories about where you can find uh, examples of, of how healthcare can be affordable. And that's texaspolicy.com slash ROH for Right On Healthcare. And we'd love to be able to, to help you and, and your family members and be able to lead you in the right direction because solutions are there. And as the Deputy Secretary had, had, um, has said, uh, we're, we're resilient as Americans. And even within the healthcare industry, we have found those that are finding solutions and being difference makers so that they can take care of people. Well, David Balot, Mr. Hargan, thank you all so much for being part of this week's live stream. And thank you for those of you in the audience for tuning in, for some submitting some, some excellent questions. We will continue this series probably in perpetuity. You know, when we started this a few months ago, we said we'll come to you each Monday and highlight the, the issue of the week, and we'll do this until the country's reopened. I think what we're seeing over the last week and a half is that there's a need to have more conversations. There's a need to have more dialogue, to listen more. Uh, that's for all of us, regardless of what we look like, regardless of what our ideological perspectives are. And the reason that we're called to do that is precisely because we have the privilege of waking up each day in the United States of America. Each of us, each of the 330 million Americans has the privilege relative to the rest of the world, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our color of our skin, to call ourselves Americans. And so this organization will do its part and hopefully then some to facilitate those conversations just like the one today. Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan, I can't thank you enough for your service, for your time. You are in your own understated way, and that's a compliment, sir, and a generation of, of great overstatements, a great leader and someone who engenders a, a lot of confidence. And I'm just grateful for everything you're doing. So to you and to David, God bless you. God bless Texas. And because we have a wonderful non-Texan with us, God bless America. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs>